part of my little story that I'm going to tell you here is that I became a yoga teacher since I graduated from college. So just for fun, if everyone wants to like move up, and we're going to like put it in a circle, just because it'll mess you all up and you're going to get shaken up. And you just come on and just like pull the chair. They're so convenient. They have wheels. Like, yeah, just like circle up in the middle. Okay. I could stand up in front of you, um, talk, but we're just going to get in a little circle. So I had zero idea about how many people were coming, so this is a cool group, and I want to say thank you for inviting me, uh, because there's nothing more that I like than people listening to me talk. Um, so I want to just ask a little bit about all of you before I launch in. So because one of the things I learned in college in public speaking classes was you should always know your audience. And besides knowing that you're all in college, most definitely likely RWU students or friends with someone who might go to RWU, you know, you say RWU or RWU? RWU. RWU or Roger. Or Roger. Or Roger. I like Roger. Yeah. <laughs> it's much easier. So, so yeah, so our, how many seniors? Okay. How many seniors leave your hands up if you have a job lined up for after graduation? So how many juniors? How many sophomores? How many freshmen? Okay. So okay, I'm um, a senior plus eleven. So <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, yeah, and so, all right, is there anything that anybody wanted to necessarily learn about today, per se? Or is there anything that's interested? Internships. Internships. And like, how to get a job? Yeah. <laughs> it's, really, it's really good information. Um, okay. All right, so I'll do my little introduction and walk you through this uh, logo resume, and then and then we can go back to like what you might want to hear more about because I did graduate from college at this point ten years ago, and I went to the University of Rhode Island. You don't have to write all this down. You can if you want to, but sometimes it's like way really too much note taking. Um, and this is all on my LinkedIn page, and if you link in with me, then it's all right there. So. Don't bother. Uh, so I left University of Rhode Island. Actually, during the time I was at URI, I did AmeriCorps, which is like the Peace Corps in the United States. I did a residential program where I spent 10 months living and working with the same 10 people. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, but it was one of the most amazing experiences I had uh, in my life. So I guess backing up, I did grow up in between Massachusetts and uh, Jamestown, Rhode Island, after some brief time in Virginia and Iceland, because my father was in the Navy. So basically, I'm from here, and I'm now back here. So went to URI, did AmeriCorps, and my AmeriCorps years were spent in the South. So South Carolina, Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi, completely and totally different than New England. How many people are from New England? <laughs> Basically, so who's not from, who's, okay, so that's a significantly further yes. away, <laughs> yes, um, who's ever lived outside of New England, raise your hands like, 
Where? Florida. Okay. It's like this north south. It's like a northern state in the south. That was my question. It's not like certain parts. Well, and then Michigan. Yeah, and then abroad as well. Which doesn't really count for well, counts for not living in New England. Um, cool. So, yeah. That's awesome. Like, I like to know my audience. So, URI graduated. My big dream, as I mentioned to a couple before everyone came in, all I wanted to do was graduate as quickly as possible. I was a communications major and a leadership minor with a concentration in public relations. Nobody ever asked me that once in any interview I've ever had for your interaction. Um, my first job, I I really, I started wanting to be an event planner. That's why when I was in high school, I was like, I'm going to play events. It's going to be great. And then, uh, I decided when I was in college that I really felt like corporate social responsibility or sustainability, now it's like green. You all probably know what I mean if I say that, whereas when I was in school, nobody knew what I was talking about. Um, so that really gave me this like new decision of what I wanted to do when I grew up. I was like, oh, I want to work with companies that you know, don't use sweatshop labor and migrants making their sweaters. I want to you know, work with companies who employ people who are old enough to work with them. That's, this is a 30 level uh, overview with a slight bit of sarcasm in there. So. Uh, so, but that really happened. So that's why it led me to what I call plan A, which was the body shop, the body shop. I had never worked in retail. How many have worked in retail? So like selling clothes at a store. It's like the best experience you're ever gonna have. Or a restaurant. Has anyone worked like food service or retail? Has anyone not worked in one of those? Have you babysat? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Or learn more about you, Miss Mystery. So, uh, so anyway, all of a sudden I became the manager of a retail store in Washington, D.C. for the body shop. I went to the body shop because the mission of the body shop is using products from responsible places. The woman who started the company, Anita Roddick, was one of the people who really transformed the way business is thought of. She wrote a book, one of her books was Business as Unusual. So doing business differently than it had been done before. So that was why I went, I was like, oh, The Body Shop is such a fantastic company. The other good example that I always go back to is Ben & Jerry's, a company that does a lot of social good. And I was like, well, I probably would do better off selling makeup than ice cream. <laughs> so I'm gonna go with the makeup. So went to body shop, quickly realized that retail store management was not gonna get me to becoming a corporate social responsibility like person. So plan A went horribly wrong. Uh, but I was there for about a year and I was in Washington DC at that point. So I said, all right, I need to return back to like my studies and my, my real life. And that's what brought me to Hager Sharp. Hager Sharp is an agency a PR agency in Washington, D.C. that does mostly health and education and public safety related things. So when I was there, I worked with the National Institutes of Health, which is um, under the Department of Health and Human Sur Services, so government, major federal government stuff. Then I left there after two years, went to uh, the Cadmus Group, where it was an environmental consulting firm. Now, this was all kind of like, this was my path, because my eventual goal is, and so is, was, still is, to be working with uh, like companies who are doing good. So that's like the goal I had in mind, and this is this crazy path I wove, because nobody's going to give you a job doing exactly what you want to do when you graduate from college, because you don't know what you're doing. Um, uh, unless you're a pilot or something like that, in which case they do. So, went to Cadmus Group. Cadmus was another big environmental consulting firm, but I was like, yes, I'm getting a little bit closer to like environment company stuff, excellent. I worked with uh, the Energy Star program. Does anyone recognize that 100% cyan uh, logo? So there, 
I did, uh, I was the brand manager. I, so I worked with the brand manager of EPA to manage the feel, the look of the brand, um, the image of the brand in the public like identity in the, in the public's eye. Uh, and the Energy Star program is actually run by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Did anyone know that? Great show of hands, if anyone actually knew that. Did you know, who knew about Energy Star? Raise your hand high. Or, did we need to do yoga to start? <laughs> we could have done that, like, okay, so, and then, we, so, so uh, did anyone know about Energy Star and know that it was uh, the EPA's program? No, that's just like an interesting thing because nobody ever did. Um, so I get so curious and excited about it. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time um, doing brand management, but also there I measured media impressions. So Energy Star, to give you an idea, they had, I worked on I mean, there's probably 300 people that work on the Energy Star program, like full time kind of thing. So when you have that many people working on a brand, there's everybody gets special stuff. So when I was there, I measured impressions um, on the internet and web, and I measured a lot of things and I reported on a lot of things. And I also did intellectual property. Who knows what intellectual property means? Raise your hand. Ish. Ish. A little bit. It's like one of my favorite things. So, so I worked with intellectual property. We'll sidebar and go back to that. And also at Energy Star, I worked with major companies. So now at Energy Star, this is one of my favorite little places where I was because I had. So I worked for a private company. Okay, so Cadmus is a private company owned by, it's actually an employee-owned company. So, but my client was the federal government. So when you work at an agency for a client, you have to do everything that, like how the client wants you to do it. So in, I didn't actually, I was not a government employee, but I had to act like one. And everything I did for the client had to be, uh, approved for the federal government. And as you can imagine, the federal government is way less sexy than working for Prada or some other super fancy brand like Smith. And I know a lot of people work for Smith, which is why I noticed that logo on your computer. Yeah, he's like, he didn't even know. Um, <laughs> so, so. So I work for a private company, but then my client was the government, and then I work with big companies like Samsung and Best Buy, because basically my job at Cadmus and with Energy Star was to help those big companies, Samsung and Best Buy, write and incorporate Energy Star messages into their like print collateral. And so basically I would sit there at my office and think of things to say, like that Energy Star wanted to say. And then I would help people at Best Buy and people at Samsung incorporate those Energy Star things into the messages that they wanted to communicate to the public. Does that make sense? This is like super, yeah, this is super rudimentary language because that's basically what happened. But then I also had to work with associations like the Consumer Electronics Association, which actually now is the, it goes by a different name, but when I worked for them, it was a Consumer Electronics Association, and that is, does, are people familiar with associations? Like even sort of kind of, what am I talking about? No, maybe, yeah. I had no idea when I was in college, so. I'm, so there's probably an association for every type of industry. So if you are a, um, a trucker, there's a trucker association. And if you are a chimney sweep, like there's a, an association where all of the chimney sweeps in the whole country join, and then all of those chimney sweeps 
come to this meeting at their association and they say, okay, we all compete against each other, or maybe we don't if we're in different areas, but what is good for all of the chimney sweeps in the country? And they would say, you know, what would be good for a chimney sweep? I don't know, to have more fires in the fireplace, I would say, right? So, so then you have this association who's like, okay, our mission is to make sure people at their houses have lots of fires in their fireplaces, because that's going to give our people business, right? So that's my example for an association. So it's a group of companies from an industry that come together for doing things that are going to better the industry. So typically, those are the things that hire lobbyists. This is this is like my DC education. P.S. I was still in Washington D.C. the whole time. So Washington D.C. and they hire the lobbyists, and the lobbyists are the ones. Do you guys know what lobbyists do? Yes. Good. If you don't know. They're the people who go talk to the Congress people and the people in government to get the government to do what the private companies want them to do. An interesting system. So that's where the lobbyists come from, is the associations. So I would say that this private company and my client was the government and I was working for these private companies and helping these private companies, but then I had all of the association interests like just chattering backwards. And it was this very, very interesting spot to be in, to learn about everybody's different agendas. Um, so that is that was CADMIS, and then, like I said, intellectual property. Now, after that, I went to Cone. Now, who came to the 12 o'clock talk? One person? Just one? Two? Three? So I can't remember her name, but she worked at Cone Communications. Cone Communications, uh, she worked for branding. So. She worked in the brand management department, so very, very traditional public relations brand work with um, different companies. Like I think she's like in Pillsbury. So Cohen Communications is a public relations firm. It's in, based in Boston. They have a New York office, some other places. Um, that's where I went because I left DC and came back to New England and was there at Cohn. And my job at Cone was working with big major companies on their corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility initiatives. Now, mind you, that was like seven years after I graduated, maybe? I don't know. Uh, no, eight years. So I finally got to like the place where I thought was like the creme de la creme of like my career eight years after I graduated college. Now, that's just an example of Sometimes it takes a long time. So I was like, oh, great, awesome. Um, one of the problems with the agency world is that when they lose big contracts, they fire people because they don't have work for you. So I was at Cone for a little while, and it was great. Um, and then they didn't get some contracts renewed. So I had been one of the first people in. So that meant I was one of the first people out. So I was like, hey, mom and dad, what's up? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna live at home and become a yoga teacher. How's that sound to you? Um, they were like, great, we love you. Um, conveniently, mm, that, so yeah, so I like left Boston, came home to Jamestown, like moved back in with my parents, became a yoga teacher, and it was wicked great. <laughs> then um, I decided, okay, I'm gonna stay in Rhode Island. Like, because I had been in DC, I had been in Boston, like, where do I want to live? I know I want to be near family, like, someday maybe I want to have my own family, where do I want to be? So I was like, okay, I want to be here. So that brought me to Hyatt Regency in Newport. And so Hyatt Regency in Newport, which is Xenia. Can you pronounce it correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. I informed her when we were walking over. By the way, I left Hyatt like a week and a half ago. Um, oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And nobody was. <laughs> so, so then I went to Hyatt. And I, so Hyatt was awesome because I had been at an agency the whole time. So when you're at an agency, you have, so when I was at Cone, I had like four different clients. When I was at Cadmus and Hager Sharp, I had anywhere between two, um, two or three 
Cadmus and Hager Sharp are very different agencies in that they have contracts that are very, very large. So for instance, the contract I worked on uh, was multi-million dollars a year. So they had 20 people, the company, Cadmus, had 20 people working full time on the Energy Star contract. That's not like a typical PR agency where if you go in as an account executive, you might have five or six different clients in all different industries. Uh, so, and five or six different clients, and then as, like a, as a function, what that means is who's, who knows how an agency works? Or if I said like billing your time, do you know what that means? Who, okay, I wanna make, okay. Billing your time, so that what, what does that mean? You're like, okay, you're gonna be at the office for 10 hours a day, and then you're gonna log into the computer. I spent one hour working on Coca-Cola, I spent one hour working on Ford, I spent four hours working on Cracker Jacks, and then the rest of my day was spent working on Samsung. So you have to write down every single hour of your day and what you were doing. And sometimes you're billing to the 15 minute increment. So you basically have to be like, okay, what was I spending 15 minutes on? You're constantly doing this. And that's how the agency knows what to charge the client. Because they're like, oh, well, our people spent 35 hours working for you. You pay us $100 an hour. And so you owe us $3,500. So, uh, so after doing that for so many years, you're like billable hours, blah, blah, blah. then you get to client side and you're like, wow, I'm the marketing manager. I'm my own boss. Like I get to tell those people, the agencies, what to do. It was a remarkable, it was remarkable. It was like a breath of fresh air in my job. I'm like, whoa, this is what it's like to just be the boss of people. Because if you work in an agency, you're never going to be the boss. Because you're only ever going to, you're always going to have to report to clients. So even if you're the CEO of the agency, you're still at the will and beck and call of what your clients want you to do. Whereas if you're the CEO of Samsung, you're like the president of everything and you get to call the shots. Because you're deciding how to make the money and hopefully your product is selling, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so then I was, yeah, at Hyatt, and my responsibility, so I was at Hyatt for the past year, and I was in charge of all social media, the entire website, all of the print materials, the, the collateral that you'd see hanging, like if you go to a hotel and you see like the ad in the elevator, or you see some sign in the restaurant, or the menus in the restaurant. Um, all of the advertisements that I went, went in local newspapers. All of the partnerships. So sometimes, have you, who's familiar with sponsorship marketing? Ish. So instead of you know, old school marketing or advertising is I'm gonna to go to the newspaper and pay the newspaper money and they're gonna put an advertisement in the newspaper for me. Sponsorship marketing, which PS is a really big business. Um, what's the name of Boston Garden? Right, what's the name of the big stadium in Foxborough? Gillette. Gillette, do you think that they are doing that for free? Or you think that Gillette is paying tons of money to have their name be Gillette? Who thinks that they're getting paid a lot of money to have it be Gillette? They are. So that's like sponsorship marketing. So, so sometimes when I was at Hyatt, what I would do was say, okay, we're gonna sponsor, so we're gonna give the Newport Polo um, we're going to give them free hotel rooms in exchange for including our name and logo for, you know, in all of their print materials. So they'll say hi as a sponsor because they're getting something they need. And that, you know, it's like a barter system or a trade. So in that sense, they're putting our logo in for, for free stuff. But sometimes it's also, it's either free stuff and 
money or just money depends on like the type of industry and the type of trade. So that was my little hospitality world and I just left there because really at this point my future goals, while I still am all about corporate responsibility and sustainability, my dream, my dream career life is to run for public office, teach college classes and yoga. Um, so in order to teach college, I have to get at least a master's degree. And you notice I never went back to school. So I left Hyatt uh, because I didn't really like it very much, if we're being honest here. This is a certain honesty and trust. Um, I didn't, I loved what I did, but it just wasn't like, the, it was like bad juju, it was a bad vibe, it was like not an awesome place to be. It was for a lot of reasons, but for me personally, I was just like, nah, I don't really like working in a hotel, actually. It's a very interesting place. Um, so right now, because um, I can't like run for office tomorrow or teach college classes, uh, so yeah, I'm gonna do some stuff independently because people will actually pay you to do marketing for them, like independently. They'll be like, "Oh, we have this small business, but we don't know what we're doing. Can you help us?" And you're like, "Sure. Here's my hourly rate, and I can help you do whatever you want." So I'm doing that um, until I go back to school, and so that's my life story in uh, half an hour. Sorry, guys. Now, so that's why I think if, if I haven't heard anything, like the path we weave, I feel like mine has been particularly nutty. It's like electronics, health and beauty, now it's hospitality, and like then I have like some yoga stuff in there, and I have medical stuff, because I was with National Institute of Health and Public, public Health Communications. Um, I don't, I mean, I haven't ever done automotive stuff. I'm like trying to think, I've done a lot of different industries. So, having said that, is there anything else besides intellectual property that anybody else wants to hear more about or like are really curious? Yes. I want to know your future plans at the school if you want to study <laughs> biology, actually. Oh my god. <laughs> no, not exactly biology. Okay. We'll get, that's a great question, because I only have it like that much of it. Um, but sure, definitely. Maybe more than your experience in More details? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Prana Flow. That, so Prana Flow is, um, Prana Flow is the yoga teacher training that I did. There's a woman named Shiva Rai, and she has trademarked a particular style of vinyasa yoga. Uh, which, it's interesting how now people are turning yoga into, you know, just like 4,000 year old practice into a business and she's trademarked it. Um, it's interesting, but they did it. But that's, that's the teacher training they did. Any other just like questions? No? No way. No way. Oh, yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> Tell me your first name again. Sherry Lynn. Sherry Lynn. You're like a girl after my own heart. I'm like Sherry Lynn. I'm like, <laughs> um, the last time I did a, uh, I, last time I did a talk, so all that's to say, there's nothing I love more than talking to college kids. No, I just, I really love teaching. I was leaving the gym like a week or so ago. Actually, it was the, it was the week I decided I was piecing out from Hyatt. And I was like, all I want to do is learn and teach. That's all I want to do. I don't want to do any of this marketing stuff. To be honest, I don't actually, I'm not passionate about marketing. I mean, I like it. It's really interesting, but I'm not like, oh, it's my passion to sell people stuff. Um, I'm just passionate about other things. So, okay, so agency versus in-house. 
the biggest, I mean, so there's a lot of different kinds of agencies. And obviously, there's almost as many different types of agencies as there are different types of companies. So at Cone Communications, they work with, like, Snuggle, the bear brand. They work with Barber, that brand. They work with uh, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and Johnson and & Johnson and CVS. And they also work with a multitude of nonprofits. So Cone is a pretty multifaceted, relatively speaking, they still have their, their focus, but they are a very traditional, big company, needs, website, social media, print, event sponsorship. So Cone does um, a lot of all of that. Very, I say traditional, but tradition word for me, traditional has changed a lot in the past 20 years. Because at this point, a traditional marketing campaign includes social media and website and that kind of thing. So agency work, the cool thing about agencies is you get to have, if you're at a place like Cone, so when I was at Cone, I had three major clients. One was in the technology field, and then one was CVS, doesn't really matter. One was CVS, one was EMC. EMC is a huge data storage company that's actually getting purchased by Dell, which I found very interesting. It's the biggest transaction um, ever in the, it's like $23 billion. Very huge, very interesting to me. So there was like computer stuff, and then there was CBS, and then there was Johnson & Johnson. And so CBS and Johnson & Johnson are like kind of the same-ish, but not really, because Johnson & Johnson products get sold at CBS. But then I had like data storage, so that is kind of completely and totally different. There's some, but then Hager Sharp, for instance, Hager Sharp works with a lot of government agencies. And based on where you want to live, I, uh, you're gonna get different stuff. So in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of government stuff happening. In New York, there's a lot more entertainment. There's a lot more you know, musicians. There's a lot, I mean, like, there's a lot more of everything. But there's far more, there's far fewer government contracts in New York than there are entertainment, for instance. Um, and the same would be, you know, LA versus Boulder, Colorado versus Boston versus Miami. So, so the agency you go to if you're interested in work, how many people are interested in working in the How many people, I'm not sure, maybe. So, I mean, so that's agencies, and typically in-house PR people, or big companies like to see people who have been in an agency. However, you can also start, like on the communications team at Dunkin' Donuts, and just learn all of that. Because the reason why I've been able to do public health and technology and consumer electronics and then you know I don't even know all and hospitality like hotels and travel is because it, like everything is the same it's like it's all a car it's just what kind of car is it is it a hotel like are you selling hotels or are you selling you know, musicians. Now, like musician and entertainment, that's obviously if your product is a person, then that's gonna be a little bit different. So, but if your product is a bagel, then you're still using the same channels. Like there's not like a different Facebook for um, bagels versus a car, you know? Like everybody wants to be on the Today Show. There's only one Today Show or Good Morning America. There's only one NBC News. There's only one New York Times. There's only one People Magazine. So it doesn't matter what you're selling because then I would imagine this, so this is the kind of stuff I learned in school and this is how it <laughs> relates to the real world. Like target market, demographics, that's all the stuff that, okay, well, if I'm selling um, 
if I'm selling Viagra, all right, just because my favorite thing to do is watch television with my boyfriend, like sports, and then watch like Dancing with the Stars, or I don't really watch that much TV, so my television is very limited to like sports and Dancing with the Stars, and then The Bachelor. Like they don't really do Viagra commercials during The Bachelor. Who watches like dude would they? Would that be like a good idea? Like how many like impotent older guys are watching The Bachelor? Probably not very many. Right? Right? Yes? No? Only if they're forced to. Or just are really crazy. Whatever, you know? So so that's how you get to um, so that's how you get to, you know, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. It's like, okay, well, I need to sell this bagel. Like, who wants to buy bagels? Well, not anybody who's gluten-free, so I'm not going to, like, or not anybody this, so I'm probably not going to, you know, advertise my bagels in a magazine that's all about, you know, uh, a gluten-free existence, right? Like, where am I trying, like, how am I trying to talk to people? Because that's what... I mean, that's what marketing, that's what public relations is. I mean, public relations and marketing are best friends. Like, PR, you could kind of say PR is a part of a broader marketing scheme because one of the things that you have to have as part of your marketing plan is eventually having some newspaper talk about you or talk about your bagels or whatever. Because that is, you, you know, so one of the companies that I'm starting to work with is a small tech company based in Rhode Island, and uh, it's kind of like, okay, so this company has just hired some new employees. This company has a really interesting owner. He, um, the owner of the company is a retired professional basketball player, and he's Danish, and so when I'm talking to him, I'm kind of like, dude, you have such like an interesting story. Like that alone is like a really cool thing to talk about. Like you're Danish, you went to University of Rhode Island, you play pro basketball, and now you own a computer company that's like doing really well. Like that's an interesting story, right? Like wouldn't someone want to know like what do you do? How did you get from like playing basketball to like computers? So that's what when you go out and when you're there, you have to sit around and be like, all right, well, what's interesting? Like, what's the story? What's the angle? Like, PR and journalism. So, like, there's there's like the journalism piece. Like, journalists uh, really try to find like the interesting story angle. Did anyone see the movie Spotlight? If you haven't seen it, you should because it is. If you're interested in PR and kind of journalistic reporting. It's a really interesting movie. A because the story is interesting, terrible but interesting. Um, it happened when I was alive. I was like, oh yeah, that's like that whole church thing. Like, oh, I learned a lot. But there's also a really interesting scene when um, one of the journalists is talking to someone, and I think one of the journalists is talking to the attorney. So. I won't give it away, but basically they said, so one of the journalists is talking to an attorney that was involved. I'm not going to give it away. And they said, we either have a story about like a really shady attorney, or we have a story about the Catholic Church. So it's like, it's the same stuff. They had the same, like they were finding the same thing, but it's what spin do you want to put on it? Like how do you want to frame it? What's going to be interesting, because ultimately, I mean, that is obviously not marketing product that's talking about a huge thing that happened, but it's the same thing with marketing a product. It's like, what, what can we, what do we talk about? Because in public relations, that's all you're, you, you're like, all right, well, like, what can we talk about? What's interesting? Like, what did the Kardashians do this week? Nothing? Well, we're still going to talk about it, you know? So... Is that helpful? Basically, I came because I wanted to be helpful. So, and I'm not going back to work this afternoon. And it's um, 2.44. So, um, so are there any questions?
Otherwise, the one big thing that I want to tell you guys about is intellectual property because I'm such a geek. I love it. Yeah? Question? My question is having gone, you know, in so many different angles, do you feel like being in college you need to know before you graduate like exactly where you want to end up? Yeah. No. So it's okay, like, you know, trying to think about and figure out, like, what works and what doesn't. Obviously, yeah. internships are helpful for that. But. Definitely. Definitely internships are helpful. Like, okay. it, I mean, if, yeah. internships yeah. are definitely helpful. If you're a junior, um, if you're a senior, don't worry. Because you'll figure it out. And first, like, actually, um, you can still get an internship immediately after you graduate, but you might actually want something that pays you money. Um, but if you're a student, I mean, one of the benefits of being a student is I would encourage you to do informational interviews. So I feel like people would be surprised at how willing anybody is to talk to a student. Now, maybe some people don't. And obviously, I'm biased because, as I already said to you, there's nothing more than I like than talking about myself. I don't actually think I'm that interesting. I just have an ability to talk a lot. So, so, so many people, you're like, hey, I'm a student. I like love what you do. Do you think I could meet up with you or send you some questions or talk to you about like what you do, what you love, what you don't love? The ability you have as a student, like using that I'm a student angle is excellent. And, and the other thing, um, you know that's it's a really great it's a really great opportunity, and that's why something like LinkedIn. Someone is the person who already invited me to join LinkedIn here. Maybe I don't think maybe I don't know who it was. So fun fact about someone from Rogers. Rogers. I don't, I don't know who it was, but so someone from Rogers. This is why I'm having that moment. You know when. You know when stars will go on stage and they like forget what city they're at and they have to like remember they're like what city, what city? Welcome Boston or welcome Pittsburgh. I just had that like terror. I'm like, where am I? So I all of a sudden just related to rock stars. Um, so so yeah, someone asked me to link in. I'm sure they saw my name. They're like, oh hey, there she is. Her picture's the same. Whatever. But they didn't. I it's like okay, it's a student. Far blue. That's the see. Arwu is what my best friend who went here used to call it when I would come here during college. That was so Um, Roger Williams. So, so anyway, but this lovely student just sent me the generic, like, I want to connect with you. Now I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. Because that, to me, I'm kind of like, at least he like, hey, saw your name on a flyer. I'd love to connect with you. And I'd be like, hey, awesome. Like, way to go. Like, put a personal message because people do get really busy. And then when you start working, you're like, you are super busy and then you want to have a life. And, you know, so a lot of people are willing to, but definitely, like, put forth that effort. Like, that putting forth the effort instead of, you know, running in at the last minute or just being like, oh, yeah, connect with you. Put in, like, technology is awesome and LinkedIn is great. I would encourage everyone to like stalk people like crazy and be like, oh, I want to like know people. It's great, but introduce yourself. That's one of my personal pet peeves. Uh, because if they don't say like, oh, hey, I know you from so and so. Do you want to link in? I'm kind of like, I don't really want to talk to you. Uh, that's me. I'm creative. Okay, so intellectual property. One of my so intellectual property is. It's actually good. Oh look, there I go. I gave you guys some definition of words. Intellectual property. It's the rights to intangible assets, such as musical, literary, discoveries and inventions, and words, phrases, symbols, and designs. Examples, it's a copyright, trademark, patent, industrial design rights, and trade secrets. This is why visual aids are great, because I would have stumbled through some dominant definitions. That's the definition of intellectual property. So it's a logo. One of my favorite how much is a logo worth story is about Ford. So everyone knows Ford 
heard of, who hasn't heard of Ford? Okay, good. Big, huge motor company. So in 2006, Ford was about to go bankrupt. And so they needed uh, a line of credit. So they were like, we have nothing, like what are we gonna do to get, like what are we gonna give some bank as collateral so we can borrow against it? Because basically the company was like valued at nothing because they were losing money and they needed access to money to get the business going again. So what did they do? They put up the logo for an amount of money. Does anyone want to guess how much money? They put, in order to establish a line of credit, they gave the rights to the logo to an investor, I think from China. Does someone want to take, guess how much money? Just shout out. Two million? Higher. Lower, <laughs> but, but closer. 23.5 billion dollars. 23.5 billion. Good guess is a 50 billion, right? You're like, that's crazy. But so literally all of the rights to the logo, like that little blue oblong thing that said Ford. Okay. 23 billion dollars. So that's why. So someone asked me, like, what am I going to do when I grow up? I, maybe my going back to school will, it depends. I geek out completely about intellectual property. I think it's so crazy that someone's idea can be worth $23 billion, like a logo. Crazy and awesome. Because that's how much brands are worth. One of my favorite um, brand examples was they're not like really trendy anymore, but a little bit. The gold, like like for women, like chunky gold watches. And then like, does that, do you guys remember that trend? Maybe, sort of, yes? Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Precisely. Okay, so, look at the watch. No, okay, so from across the room, what brand is it? See, this is perfect. This is perfect. I couldn't have had a better example. So, fun fact. So, what watch? So, what what watch? I don't want to hurt your ego now. Okay. Do you feel confident? We can have like a separate session about ego if I insult you. Okay, good. Which one do you think is more expensive, Michael Kors or Fossil? How many people say Michael Kors? How many people say Fossil? Okay, so the answer is Michael Kors is more money. How much more money does the Michael Kors watch cost versus the Fossil watch? Retail. Retail value. Like, yeah, okay, so literally, only because, so I bought, like one year, one of my aunties always gives me like jewelry and she gave me something and then I returned it because I really, I did, I like, I went to the whole ego. Like, I was like, oh, I just want that chunky, it's kind of hideous, but I kind of love it, Michael Kors watch. So I did, and I paid, I think, $270 for this watch. And then I got to work, and I was like, I got a watch. I'm like, thanks, Michael Kors. Like, does it make me seem more fancy because I have this Michael Kors watch? Like, don't you think higher of me? Like, because you do, like, you associate brands, like, like we have Mickey Mouse here. We have, well, there's another great brand, the Blackhawks. Black <laughs> um, and then, so, like, Mickey Mouse, like, worth so much money. And so, it's kind of like, or it was great because, um, so you have the same product. And literally, the Michael Kors and the Fossil watches are literally the same. They probably were manufactured in the same, like, in the same, place in China, but then one gets a Michael Kors logo and brand, and the other one gets a Fossil. And then the Fossil brand gets a $140 price point, and the Michael Kors watch is a $270 price point. 
Now, I learned this through many different ways, but the first example um, is one of my very best friends worked for a jewelry design company in Providence, and Crimson Rose, Crimson with a Z, Crimson Rose, I think the rose might have a Z too. Super cool company, but this company, they were all designed in the same place, they were all manufactured in the same place, but the products coming out went to three different price points. One, like Bloomingdale, so like high-end retail. Two, J.C. Penney retail, so like almost like Target, J.C. Penney, kind of like big box, but not. I mean, J.C. Penney might be a little bit lower, or like a Macy's, because like Macy's and Bloomingdale's are on different levels. And then the other went to Walmart. So literally the same thing that was being designed in the same place, being manufactured in the same factory, came back to the United States and was being sold in three different stores for three different price points with three different brands on it. So that's like the power of intellectual property. And that's why logos are worth so much money. And that's why what I did at Energy Star was I made sure that the logos weren't being used improperly. Because one thing that I never learned in college was um, about brand guidelines. And so for instance, Hive Regency has 270 pages, 270 pages about how to use the Hive Regency brand. 270 pages, just about how to use the brand. So, because um, I know some of you might have class and we're approaching the time. So that is, um, Intellectual property, um, that's my information. I've decided I should start using my middle name. Why doesn't anyone use their middle name, Mark? Right? Um, that's my name, that's my email address, that's my LinkedIn. Um, if you wanna link in with me, I'd be happy to introduce you guys to anybody that you wanna know. LinkedIn is a terrific um, resource to find people at companies that you might want to know. You know, you can use it as a student. It is a professional Facebook. Uh, don't use it like Facebook though. Um, but yeah, if you want to be in touch, if you have any questions, I don't have to rush out. If anybody wants to stay and ask me any more questions, thanks for inviting me. Thank you for coming. I hope it was helpful. Oh, it wasn't helpful. <laughs> If it wasn't helpful, <laughs> April Fools! Um, no, so yeah, definitely reach out if you're if you need a job, if you need an internship. Um, I do know a lot of people in the area. I know a lot of people in New York and DC. Um, the other thing I'd say is travel. Get out of town. If you grew up in New England, like go away, <laughs> go away. Um, and yeah, no. And on that note. And go away. Yeah. <laughs> you can always come back. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.